Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is Sarah Vaya, and this is the first in a series of seven webinars this summer uh, of 2021. Um, the webinars all focus on issues in climate and sustainability. And the idea of the webinars is uh, that I, my goal really is that I want to give you the big picture about each of these topics and um, describe the problems and the issues and also talk about some of the solutions so that we um, have some tangible things that we can all do to help with the problems. So today the topic is um, human impacts on insects and native plants and how we can restore biodiversity. So this is really a problem in sustainability and climate change is part of it, but humans have uh, many more impacts on um, the natural world than, um, than just climate impact. So we'll we'll talk about the whole range of things. Um, okay, so let's get going. Just to sketch the picture from, you know, sort of way back when uh, our um, the our part of North America, US, was in a much more natural state. Uh, so from about 15,000 years ago, until the Europeans colonized, uh, uh, the U.S. was covered with native forests like the forests in the West, conifer forests, mountain meadows in the Rockies, grasslands, um, uh, prairies across the middle of the country. And then the whole eastern part of the country was covered with eastern deciduous forest. This is a great picture from the Joyce Kilmer National Forest in North Carolina, which is one of the only old growth forests that's left in the eastern part of the U.S. It's really an incredible place to visit. So um, uh, up until the Europeans came, uh, the Native Americans were, you know, had some something of an impact. There were some uh, maintenance of environments by um, fires, et cetera, but very minor impact compared to what happened later. Uh, the native forests, et cetera, had very high biodiversity of plants and insects and animals. Uh, and the species in the communities and their interactions had been all tuned by evolution for many, many thousands of years. So things were working really well. We had peak ecosystem services. The water quality was, was good. Nutrient cycling, everything was going along pretty well. Uh, then we had the European colonists come in and uh, this launched a period of massive land conversion from the native um, uh, environments that I just described to agriculture and development. So if we look at what the um, U.S. looked like in 1620, uh, the whole eastern part was completely covered with forests. Then, of course, we had the Great Plains and the western forests and the mountain forests, um, uh, as shown here. In 1850, uh, you know, there was some um, colonization, of course, on the eastern um, the eastern coast and um, some colonization of the plains in the Midwest and uh, the so-called sodbusters were there beginning to um, launch into a big period of farming. By 1920, the picture is really uh, different. Most of the eastern forests had been cleared, all the old growth forests, most of it was pretty much gone. And between 1920 and 2006, what basically happened is shown here, the, um, the uh, most of the, a lot of the forest is has come back, but it's second growth that's uh, not as, um, well, <laughs> quite a bit different from the old growth forest that was there. And it's kind of filling in. It's, um, as they describe on this picture, the forests have moved, moved in on farms that were abandoned and ha are kind of filling in in the suburbs um, um, of, uh, between development. And so the European colonists basically launched this process of uh, completely altering the landscape. And the... Um, uh, the economy was really, and the farming economy in that time was really an extractive one, and it still is. The idea is uh, there was tremendous natural resources, and the the soil was really rich, and so it's just like you know, let's get the farms down there and <laughs> and uh, put our crops in. And it, it, of course, it, they began a European form of, of agriculture, which involved a lot of tillage, et cetera. So since that time, agriculture has just become more mechanized, more industrialized. 
More fertilizer is used for uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer came in around 1940 and really <laughs> was widespread after that. Um, various agricultural chemicals, tillage has been widely used. Um, the suburban landscape is covered with lawn, et cetera. So the land use is not very sustainable. And we've had a tremendous loss of native habitats and biodiversity. So um, you might ask, so what? You know, what has nature done for me recently? A lot of people, um, you know, don't really go outside. They don't, they're not really um, worried too much about the natural environment. They might, you know, people live in cities and, and don't go out very much and sort of think of the natural world as something over there that they don't really need to worry about. Um, the problem is that we all need to worry about it because the natural world in its entirety and its interactions provide a set of so-called ecosystem services that are always, as I say, playing in the background. And most people aren't really noticing them, but when they stop working, then we really notice. So this uh, figure shows a way of thinking about these ecosystem services um, in you know, sort of four parts, really. Supporting services, like out there in the ecosystem, it's really living things that form the soil. We've got biodiversity, which means the whole array of animals, plants, microbes, you know, everything living, various natural habitats. Of course, we have photosynthesis, which is the key really to everything living on earth because plants, harness the energy of the sun and turn it into with carbon dioxide, turn it into sugars, which are then essentially the plants are eaten by everything else. Okay. Most things, most other organisms can't make their own food like plants do. And so this, the plants form the basis of everything living on earth. Um, so then we have these so-called provisioning services. And uh, ecosystems, of course, include the living things, the natural communities, as well as the physical aspects of our environment. So um, all the geological formations and uh, um, the rocks and the water, et cetera. So provisioning services include, of course, water, which we all need. Food can come from the sea, as in this picture, it can come from land. Um, medicine, many, many terrestrial and marine plants uh, have medicinal properties. Of course, um, indigenous people have known this for a long time. And, um, and there are many, many um, of these uh, medicinal plants that have not even yet been discovered, okay? And of course, the ecosystem provides us with raw materials for building, et cetera. Um, regulating services. These are the ones that we're beginning to notice are not necessarily always working so well right now. Um, so we have um, flood control, really in a broader sense, control of the water flow through the environment, climate regulation, um, cleaning water and air. So the soil cleans the water, cleans the water. Um, uh, trees uh, help clean the air. Uh, and of course their roots help clean the water. Pollination, um, plants, Many, many flowering plants need to be pollinated, and this is usually done by insects, but also some birds, bats, et cetera. So these are the regulating things. These are the things which are going on in the background, which really make our life possible. Whether we go outside to enjoy nature or not, <laughs> this is all working um, to help us. And then, of course, there's the cultural aspects. And I think many of us have noticed that during this pandemic, that uh, just getting outside and being in nature and just uh, sort of appreciating the um, amazingness of the natural world has been really, really helpful. So um, aesthetic aspects, spiritual aspects, recreation, education, these are all really important. And these are part of the human culture that's important. So Many of us humans may feel like, well, okay, we're sort of on the outside of nature, but even humans can't fight the laws of nature for long. And it's biodiversity that keeps ecosystem services working. But due to human impacts, we're losing species and genetic diversity 
really fast and the abundance of many important types of organisms is declining. So I'll talk about that and uh, what we can do about it basically for the rest of the, of the time. Um, let's talk about some of these losses. Uh, I'll start with plants. And this picture is from a uh, fairly new report about the state of the world's plants and fungi. I'm not going to go into fungi, although they're really cool. Um, and it comes from the Royal Botanical Garden in gardens in Q. And this picture, um, uh, basically, besides telling us that two out of five plants are estimated to be threatened with extinction, as okay as 40% of all plants, it shows a really stark picture of a uh, probably a tropical forest here on the right, that has been over here on the left, logged, or burned and uh, looks like burned, right? Because here's the smoke. And there's been all kinds of traffic, taking the, the logs off, everything's been clear cut, uh, probably destined for maybe a palm plantation in Indonesia or whatnot. And um, all kinds of compaction of the soil, there's gonna be erosion. So this is not a good situation, but it's very common. So um, a lot of plants are in trouble, particularly plants in the rainforest. And let's talk about that a little bit more. So what are the causes of plant extinction? Um, agriculture and aquaculture are two of the big ones. A lot of tropical forest, as I'll discuss in just a second, um, is being cleared for agriculture. Biological resource use is just using the, the plants. Um, natural system modifications. I'm not really sure what that is, honestly. I'll be, I'll be frank about that. I tried to find out in the report, but it really didn't describe it. Um, uh, residential and commercial development, again, clearing forests, clearing trees for um, uh, various kinds of development, invasive and other species and various diseases, and then smaller things like pollution, although climate change is not a small thing. In fact, it causes a lot of the other things, but um, it's, it's um, in a minor role at this moment um, uh, in plant extinction. So here are the big causes. Agriculture is a huge one. We'll talk about that more later. So one thing about agriculture that's kind of interesting is that there are a lot of species of plants that we could eat, okay, that are edible, according to this report, 7,000 or so species, but only around 400 are considered food crops. And it's even more interesting than that. Uh, if we think about plant breeding and how uh, uh, sort of uh, food has been bred through the years, many, many years. Um, there's been a progressive reduction of the genetic diversity in, in the plants we eat, as well as a reduction of the kinds of plants we eat. So if we look over here, and this is in the very earliest years of domestication, so plants began to be domesticated about 10,000 years ago. And of course, these folks didn't, you know, they didn't know the principle, they didn't know about genetics, principles of plant breeding, they were just I mean, some, I, it's amazing really what people did 10,000 years ago, but they identified um, uh, individuals in their populations that were uh, producing uh, what they re regarded as good food and bred those um, um, preferentially. So we start out with a bunch of uh, wild ancestors and wild relatives of crops and, and, and food plants that aren't being used. And we domesticate those. So we go, here's a little cartoon going from big genetic diversity um, through what we would call really prehistoric domestication, um, which produced what are called land races. These are um, things like core varieties of corn and um, and squash and beans that were first domesticated, they are um, uh, uh, less diverse than the um, wild relatives. And they are basically locally adapted to the places where these folks 10,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago were living. Then modern plant breeding comes in um, using the principles of genetics and pedigrees. And we wind up with much less genetic diversity, okay? Because again, Plant breeders are breeding for characteristics that are desirable uh, in crops. And some of those have to do with how 
good the food is. And some have to do now with how easily it's harvested, et cetera. Um, and we go along through the breeding cycle and, um, and genetic diversity can be dramatically reduced. Okay. Some, some uh, crop plants are clonal, some are, are sold as hybrids, but during this process, the bottom line is we are losing a lot of genetic variability. Um, also when plants like corn, crops like corn are sold as hybrids. And if you look in your, if you're a gardener and you look in your seed catalog, you'll see a lot of hybrid plants. Well, you can't really save the seeds from those hybrid plants because they won't produce uh, the hybrid, the seeds of the hybrid plants will not produce uh, plants that look like the parent plants necessarily. So uh, that's kind of a, uh, well, let's just put it this way. That helps the seed company because you can't really save seeds. Uh, and it's also, well, we'll get to this a little bit later. Um, when we think about native flowering plants that we might want to put in our gardens to attract pollinators or whatnot. Um, this uh, graph is meant to show you that here are three native species, okay? Now in nature, the native species are genetically variable and plant breeders can take those and find um, characteristics that they want to increase in the population and they make what are, are called cultivars. So maybe they notice a, 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 um, a plant with a slightly different colored flower in this um, columbine or a different, you know, something different about the flowering, a color, et cetera. Or um, in these Rebecca, various different aspects are highlighted and turned into cultivars. Same with, with asters. Um, but although these may be showy and really beautiful in your garden, they are not always as attractive to pollinators that is not as useful in the natural environment as the wild um, species. So here's a, um, just a graphic showing that the wild type um, in yellow, and this is number of pollinator visits. So for the columbine shown up here, the wild type gets the most visits and then, you know, progressively down here to this one, which really is hardly visited at all. Now, you will get pollinators, but not as many as the wild type. Same with um, foxglove. That's not shown over here. Black-eyed Susans, these, and the various asters. The wild type always is getting more visitation. So that's kind of a problem, and you might want to be aware of that if you buy um, cultivars for your yard, um, if you want to make a pollinator garden or something. Often it, these cultivars are what are available at the big stores like Lowe's and Home Depot. It's a little harder to find actual native plants that have been bred. Um, we don't wanna use native plants collected from nature, but reputable native plant breeders collect large genetically variable populations and then propagate them. And, and so that they stay you know, fairly genetically variable. Um, when, you, when you buy one of these cultivars, um, you might find a sign, a little note on it saying propagation unauthorized. Well, that might be because they, um, th they're clonal or something, but of course it keeps you buying the plant from the, um, from the breeders or the company that bred them. So, you know, there's a lot of issues here. Um, but the idea is that the cultivars of native plants are more genetically uniform and may not be as attractive to pollinators. Okay, now let's talk about what's going on with insects. Um, to say it's an insect apocalypse is really not um, exaggerating too much. Here are just two um, uh, results of two studies, both done in Germany. And um, the first one uh, sampled insects at the same place, one nature reserve, uh, in two different times, 24 years apart. And here are, uh, they measure the insects, not by identifying each one and, and, and calculating diversity, because actually it's really hard to identify a lot of the insects. And so both of these studies use essentially the biomass of insects, how many grams of insects were collected each day. And that's not a bad approximation for insect abundance. Um, so if you compare 1989 in the green, it, pretty much in every summer month, there were many more insects collected in 1989 than in 2013. Um, and if we look at the right-hand graph here, this represents 
um, 27 years of sampling at 63 different nature preserves in Germany, a lot of different samples. Again, they used um, the weight of the sample, uh, average grams per day. And what they found was that uh, over the whole season, abundance has fallen about 75%, which is essentially what they found here. Midsummer, it's fallen more, also same as what was found here. So um, they collected a lot of data in this study on land use and other species and other things that were going on in the particular places where they took the um, samples. Uh, and they really um, uh, uh, couldn't identify just one thing that was responsible. And we'll talk about that more also in just a minute. But one of the cool things is that um, uh, regular citizens are getting much more involved in um, going out and helping professional scientists uh, observe the number of insects, the number of plants, where they are, it's citizen science kind of stuff. And um, there are are a lot of apps actually you can get on your phone that will help you to identify plants and insects and various projects where you can get this information and send it to a central location and be really helpful in trying to track the uh, sort of availability and abundance of insects and plants. So um, citizen science is, is a pretty cool thing. And I hope maybe some of you are involved in that. Um, I had to include this because I thought it was just so, so, uh, clever. Um, in the UK, uh, people have been keeping track of essentially how many insects get splat on your windshield as you're driving along. So I remember when I was a kid driving along with my dad and you know my dad would be grouching, grumbling about, oh, look, I got to go stop and clean the windshield again because there's all these insects on there. And I realized when I saw this study um, not too long ago, we came out last year, um, uh, that I really hadn't noticed that much about insects on my windshield recently. And it's no surprise because um, they, again, they followed this for 17 years and they found that uh, the average of a bunch of samples is in the solid line here. There's been a lot of big decline in the number of insects. And then the dotted lines just give you sort of the range of the samples. Now, they've cranked up this citizen science project in the UK where you can get an overlay for your license plate. This is a British license plate. And um, it's, I, I think, a little sticky or something. And so as you're barreling along in your car, this is in the front, um, insects go splat on this, <laughs> on your license plate. Um, you don't want to put something on your, on your windshield, of course. Um, and so I was really disappointed because I would love to have been able to do this, but it's only in the UK. So anyway, there's lots of people in the UK driving around with these um, uh, splatometers on their license plates, which I think is pretty darn cool. Okay. Now, why is um, insect abundance declining so precipitously. And again, here's the sort of pie chart that gives uh, assigns responsibilities to various sectors for um, the how how much of the decline is attributable to each sector. Again, intensive agriculture is the top, and of course that includes pesticides. Although there's a lot of pesticides used on lawns and um, uh, in, re in residential areas and also in you know, municipal and commercial lawns. So that is, this is really all kind of agriculture in the large sense. Um, fertilizer, same thing, that's over here in the blue. Um, various ecological traits uh, cause some decline. And that means uh, th these are um, traits like uh, insects that are very specialized. And if they're, if they're specialized and their host plant is, re is removed or reduced, then they are reduced in numbers. Or maybe insects that can't compete very well with invasive species. Um, so that's sort of an ecological trait of the insects. Um, urbanization, we'll talk about this a lot. This is really the sort of reduction of diversity of plants in urban and suburban landscapes. And finally, deforestation, the, these make up the big six, um, accounting for more than 75% of the decline in insect abundance. Um, now, the insects aren't out there in a vacuum, okay? The insects, native insects, are eating native plants. As native plants decline, then there's fewer insects. There's also less 
effective pollinate, pollination of the plants. But when there are fewer insects, then if we go up the food chain, there are fewer birds, okay? So birds that feed insects to their young, like these martins and swallows, can't breed as successfully if insect populations are declining. So uh, this is another um, study from the UK. San Martin and House Martin are not found in the US. Barn swallows, of course, are found. And what these graphs show is um, insect abundance on this axis on a log scale, right? So um, it's uh, uh, um, essentially we would have an even bigger curve here if it wasn't on a log scale. You can see the distance between zero and one uh, uh, and between one and two, everything declines. That's because it's on a log scale. So the number of breeding pairs versus how many insects there are. Um, as there are more insects, more breeding pairs are found in, in uh, populations because there's more food for their young. Fewer insects, less breeding pairs. Okay, so that's the basic picture here. When we don't have as many insects, we don't have as many birds. When we don't have as many insects, we don't have as many butterflies. Okay, so uh, many... Um, prey, uh, excuse me, when we don't have as many caterpillars, we don't have as many butterflies, obviously. <laughs> so, okay. Now, when it comes to saying why uh, we're having this problem, as I said, there are a number of causes. And so this figure is from a paper that came out just this year in Proceedings of the National Academy. Um, and I really love it because it has a nice graphic and the idea of the paper, it's about insects, but it applies to plants just as well. So is that there's no single cause of their decline. Okay. It's death by a thousand cuts. So um, we have global threats to insects and plants of a whole bunch of different kinds. And I have divided this, um, the, this picture into two parts, direct human impacts on insects and native plants. And these are shown here. And then uh, a little later on in the talk, I'll show the things that in the paper are up here. Um, but the direct human impacts on insects and native plants, as we talked about before, agricultural intensification is a huge one. Deforestation is a huge one. Um, so here's deforestation, agriculture, insecticides, et cetera, introduced species, which expand their range and then become even more problematic. Um, pollution, urbanization, also huge problems. Here's uh, nitrification from fertilizers from agriculture. So I'll give you some examples of how each of these is affecting uh, plants and insects. And then um, as I can, I'll give you uh, some ideas about what we can do about it. Okay, deforestation and industrial agriculture in the tropics. This is a really... Um, Tragic, tragic thing. Um, here's a little block of tropical rainforest, probably in Indonesia, because it looks like these are palm plantations. And so the native forest in, in the Amazon and in Indonesia is being cut down for, in this case, um, making room for palm plantations. In the Amazon, the native forest is cut down and soybeans are planted. Okay, so this is a really scary picture, right? Because you know, these are giant machines. And so this is a huge area of formerly tropical rainforest, which has been cleared and is now growing soybeans. Um, and so what's the big deal about that? Well, when you clear a tropical rainforest, you are losing a ton of biodiversity. When we just think about plants, um, there are two, about 250,000, you know, plus or minus named flowering plant species that live in rainforests. Okay. And there are a ton more that are not discovered, probably five times as many as this. And again, as I said before, many of them have medicinal properties. All of these named plant species, 170,000 live in the rainforest. Okay. In Indonesia, there are 25 named plant species. This is just one country, a series of islands, right? 40% of those don't live anywhere else. So when you cut tropical forest in Indonesia, you are taking out species that do not live anywhere else. So they're gonna be going extinct. You lose them forever. In the Amazon rainforest, just switching to insects, there are two and a half million plus or minus, named species of insects in the Amazon rainforest. When you cut the Amazon rainforest and turn it into soybean fields, you lose all those insects because they don't eat those, they don't eat soybeans. So 
let's just compare the loss, the sort of losses uh, that we get when we deforest the rainforest to um, still tragic, but, but less diverse situation in North America. In all of North America, we have 17,000 named pl uh, flowering plant species compared to 170,000 in rainforests. We have 91,000 insect species in North America compared to two and a half million plus in the Amazon. So it's not like we don't have anything, but um, the consequences of destroying the rainforest is, are, are just enormous. Um, once you do this, for this, the soil gets really degraded and um, the tropical forest can't regrow, okay? Uh, and so it's basically a one-way trip <laughs> from this to soybeans or palms. It's a bad, bad situation. And there are various solutions, but they are very difficult solutions because um, the countries who own these resources um, of course, feel that they have the economic right to utilize them. And it's it's a big problem, okay? All right, industrial agriculture in the US. 41%, again, plus or minus of US land is in agriculture. Um, again, it's a very extractive approach, just as we saw uh, when the rainforest is cleared. Um, and in this approach to farming, monocultures are the most efficient. So mostly in, um, U.S. agriculture, we grow monocultures of corn, soybeans, or cotton. Those are the big commodities. Um, uh, fruits and vegetables are also grown in large monocultures, but, uh, you know, the, the, uh, corn, soybeans, and cotton are the big ones. Um, in this kind of a setting where there's a lot of tillage and et cetera, the soil is really depleted. And so American agriculture depends on a lot of synthetic nitrogen, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, the whole nine yards. Um, most U.S. farms are small and farmers are on the financial edge. A lot of farms have gone out of business, but a few U.S. farms are gigantic. And so this is a kind of interesting graphic. The largest 4% of farms in the U.S. produce 66% of all farm sales. And it turns out that these huge farms also get a lot of the taxpayer subsidies, including the um, the subsidies during the Trump years for the trade um, uh, issues, and also the subsidies that and um, payments that were given to farmers for the during the COVID pandemic. Uh, most of those went to these big big farms, and many many small farms have been lost over the years, particularly in underserved communities. But uh, um, Black and Hispanic uh, farmers had a very, very hard time and have uh, many, many farms have been lost. When we come to, you know, who is providing the seeds, et cetera, just four corporations, four gigantic corporations control most of the seeds, the chemicals and the digital agriculture platforms. Those are, you know, like uh, precision farming where, where farmers are entering data on their fields and um, uh, determining how much fertilizer needs to be put down in this spot. And they send all this information onto these platforms, which are controlled by these giant companies. So BASF is um, a big one. Bayer and Monsanto merged not too long ago. Dow Chemical merged with DuPont. Okay, so they're huge. And Syngenta, they've also merged now with the Chinese company. Monsanto, of course, is the um, purveyor of uh, Roundup glyphosate, and they also sell farmers Roundup ready plants, that is corn, soybeans, cotton, et cetera, that um, uh, you can spray with Roundup to kill weeds while the crop themselves is growing. Big issue. Okay. Now, this is a very, very powerful lobbying block, okay, uh, of corporations, the U.S. Farm Bureau, various commodity groups, all of whom want to keep this just like this, okay? And so it makes it very hard to change. Um, how does intensive ag reduce biodiversity? Well, of course, these huge monocultures exclude native plants. When you don't have any native plants, you don't have any insects that eat those plants, pollinators, et cetera. Um, and you know, that drives the insect populations down. The only ones you have left are the pest insects that are eating the crops. Um, 
the soil, as I said, becomes really degraded. It damages the whole soil food web, which is a big problem because that, uh, that it helps with um, water purification, et cetera. The, in, in, in healthy soil, it helps purify the water. If you damage it, then it doesn't. Um, you get increasing impacts of drought and flooding because the water, rainwater doesn't infiltrate very well. Uh, you've got a lot of agricultural runoff. So here's a little map of the potential for pesticide runoff at the edge of the field to exceed water quality threshold for humans. Well, pretty bad right here in the center um, in our big farming area. This is also the area where an awful lot of um, glyphosate is used, Roundup. Um, and um, since the advent of Roundup ready crops, glyphosate use has just, you know, skyrocketed. Um, so this is a big, big problem, okay? And it, it's going to be super hard to change, um, but there are ways to change it. And uh, this is not sustainable. Um, we get terrestrial insects killed by agricultural chemicals, like, of course, the whole monarch neonicotinoid um, scenario. Uh, aquatic insects are killed by the chemicals that run off um, nitrogen pollution, toxic wastewater. So we're really going to have to do something about this because with any extractive economy, well, you can't extract forever, right? <laughs> you have to sometimes put back. And um, yet there are powerful forces saying we want to keep this just like this. Big issue. Solutions. Well, one thing is to help small farmers be successful and try to increase equity across the population of farmers. And the USDA is currently trying to do this. Um, they're running into some roadblocks if you've been reading um, uh, about this at all. I don't, I'm not going to go into detail about it. But um, the uh, idea that really is um, necessary is to promote more, pr promote more diverse agriculture and mixed regional land use. And so here's one picture from a paper that came out um, in 2018. Um, this is strawberry industrial strawberry production in California. You can basically see tons of strawberries. Um, tilled, you know, no other plants here. And the authors of this paper contrast that with a more diverse farming situation, where here's a smaller field of strawberries and around the strawberries, we've got trees and other things going on. And here's another farm over here. And they suggest that um, uh, making more diverse agriculture, uh, growing different things in smaller fields, um, is uh, going to be a better thing, which is true. And they sketch out a regional vision like this, where you might have a farm um, or a couple of farms where several different kinds of crops are being grown. And in the same area, there's a riparian forest that is forest along a, a river or stream. There are some rangelands where there's you know grasslands and grazing, et cetera. And so if you look at the whole region, you've got a mixture of plants and a much bigger possibility that there'll be a diversity of native plants and insects that are able to find enough food in this sort of diversified landscape. Obviously, this is not as efficient as this or as the miles of monoculture corn or soybeans. And um, because it's not as efficient, that means that it, food prices would be higher, right? One reason that we have very, relatively speaking, inexpensive food in the U.S. is because we've got these gigantic monocultures, okay, very efficient. Um, same with meat. We have inexpensive meat because we've got these gigantic meat production um, situations. If we want things to be more sustainable, it's probably going to be more expensive. That's a problem, you know, right there is kind of where the problem, where the problem comes. We might want it to be more sustainable, but mm, nobody really wants to pay more for food. So we'll talk about that later. Okay, let's get off of agriculture and talk about introduced species now. Um, one of the introduced species that's really ravaging for us on the East Coast is this little creature right there called the hemlock woolly adulgid. It's a relative of an aphid, so it um, sucks the phloem out of plants. And it, these little insects disguise themselves by producing this waxy, white waxy stuff, which is why they call them the woolly adulgid. Um, and they were introduced in Northern Virginia in 1951. And 
these different colored lines basically show how their range has been expanding, expanding, expanding um, all up and down the East Coast. The gray on this picture is the range of the hemlock. And so wh where is the hemlock woolly adulter going? Everywhere there's hemlock. OK, and this is especially facilitated because now it's getting a lot warmer up here, so they can just pretty much expand away. What do they do to the hemlocks? Well, they do this. They kill the hemlocks because they're, you know, essentially eating, eating the sugar that they make. And this is what the Shenandoah forest used to look like back way back in the day. And now mm, here are all these dead hemlocks. And so this is tragic because hemlocks are beautiful and they're really dropping out of the forest in the east. In the west, they've got the pine beetle problem. We have that in the southeast now, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Pine beetles are little, tiny beetles. Here's an adult. Okay, here's an adult compared to the tip of a pencil. Here's a larva. And the adults lay their eggs underneath the bark, and then the larvae just chew around and make these, you know, uh, sort of galleries. And in, you know, doing that, they essentially girdle the tree. They take out the the um, the wood wet, which is holding the xylem and phloem, which is allowing the water to move up and the sugar to move down, and that kills the trees. That turns a green conifer forest into this brown dead trees. Um, there are various species of pine beetles. The mountain pine beetle in the red started in California. And as winters warmed up, it moved north, 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 up into British Columbia, eating all the pine trees. Um, and then it was able to cross the Rocky Mountains because it warmed up enough that it was, you know, uh, not frozen in the winter. OK, so they crossed the Rocky Mountains. And that's shown here. Um, so that is making the situation with the pine beetle even worse because the pine beetle jumped over the Rockies, you know, so, so to speak, and um, switched on to a different kind of pine tree, uh, the jack pine, which is found all across Canada. And now they are mm, trudging east on these, uh, not trudging, but moving east on these trees. And soon they will meet the southern pine beetle which was down here on pitch pine and now is rapidly moving up northwards and um, um, using you know, red pine and up here is jack pine. So they're gonna meet up with the mountain pine beetle. So what's that gonna do to pine forests in the east and the, you know, the, the sort of plains of um, uh, Canada? It's gonna pretty much decimate them. Already uh, in Maryland, there have been economic impacts of pine beetle on um, on pines and, you know, they're finding them all, all up and down here. So this is what happens as it warms up and invasive species can move around more freely. Okay, invasive plants. Um, all of you know, they are everywhere. Okay, and uh, this graphic illustrates from 2016, it's from the Forest Service, uh, the sort of presence of invasive plants. Now, this is not the number, but what this represents is um, each one of these little places is a subplot. And so the Forest Service just went to these all these different places, all these subplots, and said, are there invasive plants there? They didn't count how many, they just said, are they there? And so this is the num the percentage of subplots invaded by invasive plants. Well, pretty much up and down the Appalachian, up and down the Appalachians. Yeah, all of them, most of them. Um, and then you can see so many here and some out here, et cetera. So a gigantic problem. Um, one of the species we have a lot of trouble with here in the mid-Atlantic is oriental bittersweet. Looks like this, has a nice orange berry, but covers up everything. It's one of those vines. Um, that just grows up and pretty much covers up everything, kills the trees and smothers it. And, and again, reduces the biodiversity. So you have a nice diverse forest covered, all those trees die, and you wind up with this introduced nothingness that no native insects uh, want to eat. Um, okay, solutions to introduce species, well, hmm. I don't really know. It's pretty hard to go out and pull them out. Even most of the time you pull them out, they just sprout right back. Uh, how do you keep them out? I don't even know whether you can. So it's it's a big, big problem. Um, 
I'll just leave it there. Now, let's talk about urbanization. Okay, an awful lot of urbanization on the East Coast, but everywhere else too. Um, about 50% of US land is either residential, okay, residential, um, municipal in parks or around municipal buildings, in around commercial buildings, or tied up in roads and paved. Um, so most of this 50%, the landscape is either a monoculture of introduced turf grasses, okay, grass, 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 lawn. Um, we have for about 42 or 45 million acres of lawn in the US, that's another topic, but that is not supporting any biodiversity to speak of. And obviously this is not doing much for us either. Uh, so, um, the whole urbanization, and it's not just in these cities, okay? It's urban and suburban, okay? And exurban and even rural, right? So you go, you drive around a, along a rural road, there's a lot of grass around people's homes, et cetera. Um, so this uh, is a study done by everybody's favorite field biologist, Doug Tallamy, who is right here. And um, he and his students, um, have been studying uh, insects and their impacts uh, on um, uh, sort of insects and native plants and the impacts of losing insects on birds uh, for a long time. And this is a really fundamental study where uh, Doug and his squad of students and postdocs have went out and visited a lot of people's yards. And they noted how many what fraction of the plants in the yards were not native. And then they also noted for each backyard, so each of these little dots is a backyard. Um, they noted for each backyard, um, how many um, caterpillars or spiders, which are the prey of the Eastern chickadee, um, Carolina chickadee, sorry. Um, how many caterpillars or spiders were there? Okay. And so uh, what they found was when you do not have very many non native plants, that is when most of the plants in the yard are native, there's, you know, more prey for the birds, obviously. And as you get to more and more non native plants, then the prey declines. Um, this is a big problem because if there's not enough for the birds to eat, then you're not going to have birds nesting in your yard and you're not going to have birds in your region um, if everybody's yard is filled with non-native plants. So that's a huge, huge problem. Um, solutions. There was a wonderful paper in the same issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy as, as the figure I showed you earlier about the 10,000 cuts called Eight Simple Actions That You Can Take in Your Yard, okay? Um, and uh, here they are. Uh, this is the first four at least. Convert your lawns as you can to more diverse natural habitats. Now, you don't have to do this all at once because that's pretty daunting. Um, but I will point out that even if you have a, you know, a condo, a little tiny piece of lawn in the front, you can put native plants. Um, th this is a building in downtown Annapolis, front yard turned into native plants. So, you, you know, everybody can do something, even put native plants in pots. Um, but here's a sort of progression that's really ideal in the kind of suburbs we have a lot of in Maryland where you've got houses and they, you know, there's no fences or anything. And there's just kind of contiguous um, lawn most of the time with a few trees scattered around, maybe a little bit of foundation planting. And so the idea here is how do you go from this to something that has a lot of habitat? Well, you do it sort of gradually maybe plant a few more trees around the border of your property, okay? And then build up those beds, add some native plants, shrubs, ground covers, flowering things, you know, beautiful native flowering things, perennials, and, you know, keep, keep up, keep chipping away at the lawn, build up some beds around the house, maybe put some in the front yard. Um, and until you've got about 50% less lawn than you had before. Okay, so that's the, telling me basically is working on the premise that if we could just get the lawn reduced by 50%, it would make a big difference. And I like this progression because what you can see is not only in this neighborhood has this house been able to reduce the lawn, but the neighbors have all been working together so that they wind up with a large area of habitat 
that you know couldn't be sustained by just one yard, um, uh, but provides a lot of habitat for you know various kinds of wildlife and insects and native plants. And so the biodiversity in this neighborhood is really you know gone up. Um, so that's kind of the direction we would love to go. Um, grow those native plants. Uh, watch out for the cultivars, as I discussed. It's not that hard to grow native plants from seed, and you can buy, you know, good verified native seed from uh, various seed companies. Um, usually not like Burpee or something. You have to go to a native seed company. Uh, but it's not too hard to, to grow, you know, those little seedlings yourself, much less expensive than buying them. But, it, you know, that's not for everyone. Um, it's really important to reduce pesticide and herbicide use in your yard. Uh, so don't, you know, don't put a lot of lawn chemicals on there. Um, this should also be reduced fertilizer use. Um, if you have weeds, one thing that really works for weeds is to mulch your beds with mulched up leaves or hardwood mulch or whatever. Um, uh, and that just blocks the germination of the weeds and that really helps. Um, if you've got some weeds you want to get rid of, you can spray vinegar on them. Uh, horticultural vinegar can be gotten. That's very concentrated. Um, okay. Vinegar is acetic acid. You, you knew this. And if you buy like white vinegar at Safeway, it's 5% acetic acid, but you can buy horticultural vinegar, which is maybe 15, 30, even 45% acetic acid. If you use that, you put it in your, one of your little sprayers, you need to remember that it's acetic acid. You want to have on a respirator and you want to have on gloves and you want to protect yourself because the vapors, of course, if you breathe in the vapors of 45% acetic acid, it's not going to be good for you. So be a little careful. One reason people loved Roundup was that it would go on, you spray it on the leaves or you could paint it on the leaves and it goes down and kills the roots. Vinegar does not do that. Um, vinegar will kill the above ground, but it does not kill the roots. So vinegar works really great when you have newly germinated weeds because the newly germinated weeds don't have enough roots, don't have enough oomph to put up more foliage if you kill the top off. So it really works great in your garden. Um, it's good to use mulch and ground covers uh, in your beds around your house because you cover up the soil with stuff, either other plants or with mulch, and then the weeds don't have that much of a chance. Number four, be really careful about exterior lighting. Instead of using white lights, whether they're you know uh, compact fluorescents or LEDs, go to a different uh, sort of color, go amber not even yellow, go a little bit orange or to amber. And I read some really interesting studies about this that showed you know, how many insects come to white light, yellow light, amber light. And amber light actually does reduce the amount of insect, you know, insects that are drawn to the light down to about 20% of what white light does. Um, and so that's really great. So if you have porch lights or whatever, you can get amber LED lights and just plug them in. And that's a real simple fix to having all these insects crowding around your lights at night and then dying. Um, also, even though we really hate mosquitoes, it's important to avoid the mass death of insects through bug zappers and, and using mosquito foggers. Um, when the guys from the mosquito company come and spray it kills all kinds of insects, not just mosquitoes. And I wanted to pass on this great idea I got from Doug Tallamy's book, um, which I have right here, Nature's Best Hope. And he described a really awesome fix to the mosquito problem. Take a bucket in your you know, yard, fill it with water, put some straw or some grass clippings or something in there and let it sort of marinate for a little while. And female mosquitoes who want to lay their eggs will be drawn to that. And they will lay their eggs in that bucket. And then you can drop in some what they call mosquito dunks, which is really um, um, like uh, granules of a natural mosquito killer, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a pro product from bacteria, totally harmless to humans and other living things that aren't bacteria. And um, that'll kill off those mosquitoes in the bucket. And then, you know, there you are. <laughs> you just get rid of it, dump it in your yard. Um, so anyway, 
you don't have to go the chemical or the bug zapper route to try to get rid of bugs in your yard. Okay, um, several more actions. It's very useful to reduce the runoff of soap from washing your car and also to reduce the use of driveway sealants and de-icing salts, all that stuff which washes down into the waterways and is harmful for aquatic things, including people. Um, and so those are five things that are sort of operational things. The other three things here are educational things. Like a lot of people who don't get out in nature very much are completely afraid of insects. And um, yet most insects will not hurt you, okay? There's a honeybee might sting you if you go up and torture it, okay? Or a tick might jump on you. Um, and you can deal with that by, you know, not going up and nagging a honeybee or, you know, watching yourself for ticks. But most insects are not gonna be harmful and they do really cool things. Although I have to say, I'm here's a cicada. I have to say, I'm really happy the cicadas are just about done here. <laughs> As that was, we were, I live in outside of Baltimore. We were in the epicenter and it was really wild. Anyway, um, so when you can, Try to help people understand, for example, that native bees don't sting, okay? And, um, you know, here's a bumblebee. Uh, and there's lots of little tiny native bees. They don't sting. You don't have to worry about that. And um, most insects are not going to, you know, bite you or sting you or hurt you or fly up your nose or do anything obnoxious. And so um, it's kind of useful to talk about the upside of insects rather than the downside. And also to counter native uh, negative perceptions that people have of native plants. They, I think a lot of people in the suburbs are uh, sort of have an idea that if their neighbors grow native plants, that their yards are going to look as if they just abandoned them. It's going to be like a vacant lot. That's not true, of course, but it, there's an educational process that has to go on. So um, become an educator, talk to people just in your conversation, advocate for insect and plant conservation, get involved in local politics in your municipal decisions about whether or not people can plant native plants in their front yard. We've had a big to do about that in Maryland. And in fact, last year, the Maryland legislature passed a rule that prohibits homeowner associations from forcing people to plant only lawn in their front yard, which I thought was pretty progressive. Um, as always, it's important to support science, to use the science as the backdrop for decision-making, um, which is um, not always happening right now in the US, so it's also very important to vote. I added my own number nine. Doug Tallamy um, pointed out that if we all just reduced our yard by 50, our lawn by 50%, we could sort of consolidate and have our own homegrown national park that would be a refuge for native plants and insects. And if you want to read about that, um, read his book called Nature's Best Hope or uh, tune into one of his awesome talks. He's a really fantastic entomologist. Okay. Climate change impacts on insects and native plants. Climate change, of course, is a really huge problem that's becoming more and more huge, and its impacts are becoming more evident all the time. And we'll talk about that in many ways uh, during the other webinars in this series. Um, so I talked about the items down here, which were other impacts. Now I'll talk about uh, impacts of climate change, um, including changes in the seasons, which are causing habitat loss and are causing species to migrate. Um, uh, Climate change, changes in temperature, pattern of precipitation, et cetera, are causing species that interact to become asynchronous and not interact pr uh, properly anymore. So plants and pollinators aren't out at the same time, et cetera. Um, drought and fire are causing some big problems. Sea level rise and storms also causing big problems. I'll give you some examples of the top three here. Uh, and again, some solutions when I am able. So change in seasons from climate change. All gardeners know that the hardiness zones that uh, have moved, hardiness zones uh, reflect the lowest temperature in the previous 15 winters. And um, they, you know, they're colored like this and they're numbered um, and they essentially reflect what plants can survive in your neighborhood. And so most um, 
uh, commercially available seeds, et cetera, are, um, ha have a hardiness zone categorization. So if I buy this um, banana plant, it is not going to be able to grow over winter in my backyard in Maryland because it only grows in more Southern areas. So this is what the hardiness zones looked like in 1990. Here's a map in 2015. Superficially, they look very similar, but if you look closely, um, and actually Maryland is one of the states that has changed the most. Here's Maryland, okay? And um, we, uh, where I used to live, where I still live, where I live, we're, I was right in the border of zone six and zone seven. Now, Maryland is pretty much all in zone seven, except a little bit, which is now in zone eight, the orange. Um, if you look at this light green, that's zone six, big changes up here, okay? Zone six is moving up, okay? Up into Michigan, et cetera, up in here. And you look at the cold, Older zones, zone three, the dark blue, zone three is moving out of Maine, okay? The purple shrinking, it's being replaced by zone five. So what's happening is as it is becoming warmer in a given location, more species are able to overwinter because it's warmer. And um, uh, some species may not be able to manage those higher temperatures and they are forced to move northwards and plants move because seeds are dispersed. So plants can move very slowly and move up northwards as the southern end of their range becomes unsuitable. So this causes in a local place, your yard, say, loss of habitat because now it's too warm for that species to live and local extinction, which means the species is not present in that place anymore. Um, a study of migration and local extinction uh, that was done a few years ago showed that when there is migration due to climate change, again, following those, those um, hardiness zones, um, you get a sort of picture like this. Here's just a cartoon of a local range and some population, say, of a plant. And um, north is this way, right? So as it warms up, the suitable habitat moves northwards. And so we get some new populations of the that species. But down here where it used to be suitable, they can't live anymore, so they go extinct. That's called local extinction. The species is still living, but not in that place. And this study revealed that about 50% of the time where people can identify that there was move, you know, movement due to climate change, um, about 50% of the cases, and this is just shown in this graph, in temperate and tropical environments, in terrestrial, freshwater, and marine, that's the ocean um, environments, about 50% of the time, there's local extinction. Okay, so species in your neighborhood will be leaving because they can't live there anymore. They, it's too warm. And new species will be coming in from the south because now they can live there as it warms up. So things are changing in you know, your neighborhood. Um, this is uh, going to have big impacts on the forest. Um, this is a, a graphic from the um, U.S. Forest Service Tree Atlas, Climate Tree Atlas, which is kind of a cool thing to look at. And um, it shows the distribution or the sort of makeup of the forest now. And here's the different kinds of forests. So if we look at, you know, this dark green, which covers most of Maryland, um, and uh uh, we can find it down here. It's oak hickory forest. Okay, that's familiar to all of us. Stretches across a large part of the U.S. If we let things carry on as they are, that's called business as usual. If we let that go on and let climate change just proceed unabated, what's going to happen is the eastern forests are going to change tremendously. So um, we're going to get the uh, oak and pine and the light green moving northwards. Okay, just a little bit of that now. Moving northwards, the um, oak hickory that was here will still be here, but it'll move way northwards. Okay, pretty much squeezing out this, which is maple, beech, and birch. Okay, there go the maples, right? Okay, oop, bad for maple syrup in Vermont, et cetera because the maples aren't gonna be able to live there. We have um, spruce and fir forest now in Northern Maine, really beautiful. Nope, not in, if we let climate change go as it is, we won't have those trees anymore. Um, 
in Minnesota and Wisconsin, there's aspens and birches. Um, and then there's some other um, uh, pine forests up here. Mm, those are going to be pretty much gone. So this is not going to be the biggest problem we have if we get to 2100 with no climate action, but it's going to really change the nature of the landscape. Okay. I want to talk a little bit more about how changes in seasons due to warming winters affects flowering plants. This is a very cool study that was done by a former colleague of mine, David Inouye, who used to be in the Department of Biology at University of Maryland. And his research for 45 years, at least, um, was every summer he went out to the Crested Butte Biological Station in Colorado. And he and his students and postdocs kept track of flowering time in a whole boatload of species. Here's the list. You don't need to know exactly which ones they are, but a whole boatload of species they measured. When did they first flower? When did they last flower? When was the peak, et cetera? And if you do this kind of thing, you know, over a long term, you can see very subtle changes. Here's the average flowering time in this pink dotted line when they started. And this is relative, right? So it doesn't say how many, it, it, how many, you know, what date, but it's the number of days per year that was that have changed. And again, you don't need to know what these species are, but just look at this pattern. Most of the species are now flowering earlier, half a day to one day earlier than they used to. Some are flowering even more than that. So this is, these are just an average 69 different species. So this is a bona fide important pattern. Um, the other thing that happens is when these plants flower earlier, they're often smaller. When plants are smaller, when they flower, they don't have as many resources, so they can't produce, produce as many seeds, and they cannot produce as large of seeds as they would if they flowered later. Um, and that has a big impact just sort of on the whole dynamics of the populations. So this is a wonderful example of why it's worth supporting long-term studies, because you can only see these patterns if you follow things for a long time. Um, David, anyway, showed many other things, but one other thing that he showed is flowering earlier can be a big problem for plants. So here's a very nice example, beautiful delphinium in the mountains of Colorado. And if it warms up and it's, you know, we have a very warm spring, um, which in Maryland would mean a really warm February, but which out there probably means a really warm April or May. Um, even though it can be very warm on average earlier than usual, generally you get some cold weather after that. And these unexpected cold snaps can lead to freezing and flower loss in these native wildflowers. So this early warming, sort of unusually early warming and flowering is called fault spring. And it's false because almost inevitably there's freezing that goes on after. And so here's a delphinium flower that got, you know, snowed on and frozen. And then the flowers don't develop. There's no pollen. There's no nectar. There's no seeds. There's nothing. And um, or less. Right. Um, and so that's bad for the pollinators. But it's also bad for the plants because that plant doesn't set any seed um, for the following year. Now, the plant population doesn't die out right away because the plants are perennial. So the roots, you know, they come back the next year, but it's not good to never get any seed coming in. So this is, this can be a problem. Um, the other thing that happens is that um, when climate change changes the seasonality, changes the temperature, each species responds to that independently. Right. So the pollinators, in this case of the mountain wildflowers, hummingbirds, this is a beautiful hawk moth that pollinates that delphinium, a butterfly pollinating another mountain flower. The flowers move their flowering time earlier. The plants move their flowering time earlier and the hummingbirds or insects are responding in their own way to changes in temperature. So they might not respond together. And that very frequently causes um, pollinators and their hosts and predators and their prey to get out of whack because the timing of their interactions have been tuned over many years by, you know, thousands of years by evolution. And 
it gets messed up when they respond independently to climate change. So bad for plants, bad for pollinators, just not that great. Um, I wanted to show you all this picture uh, because uh, this is a really cool field station in Greenland. And uh, um, probably, I don't know how many of you might be aware that there are these intrepid field biologists out there in these places all over the place, uh, figuring out how nature works. And so in this field station, you know, you can have a laboratory and a musk oxen will, <laughs> a musk oxen, I think that's plural, will um, walk past, which is pretty wild, but a beautiful spot, right, for the, you know, very short period that these flowers are blooming. Um, this guy's not studying these flowers, he's studying mosses, but, you know, you get the picture. So when these folks were up there in Greenland studying for many years, the flowering of this particular flower, which I didn't put a picture of, they, as David anyway found, it uh, showed that the date of flowering was became earlier and earlier as time has worn on. And the number of days of flowering also has declined, okay, as the temperature has increased. Um, so, uh, you know, that means that the flowers are not out there for as long. Now, if you look at when the insects are out there that pollinate the flowers, they really haven't been affected that much by the change in temperature. And so this graph basically shows that the temporal overlap, the number of days that there are both flowers and insects to pollinate them is declining as the temperature increases. So that's, um, they're getting out of whack. There are gonna be days when the flowers are out when there's no insects, days when the insects are out when there's no flowers. And so that um, is going to affect the um, long-term population dynamics of both the insects and the flowers. Okay. Moving on to drought and fire. Unfortunately, the oldest, largest trees die first when there's a drought, okay? This was also a fire, but they die first in the drought. And they're the hardest to replace because they're the oldest, okay? Um, and drought is an enormous problem in the West. Uh, there was a 10-year drought that sort of retreated a little bit for a few years, but now the West is back in huge drought, probably worse than before. Um, and uh, that leads to fires because you get everything really dry and then, you know, anything can start a gigantic fire. When you have, you know, one or two fires, you know, not too close together, the, the forest can regrow. But when you have repeated wildfires, the forest starts to change in its composition from a uh, north temperate, like this is from California, a north temperate sort of a, uh, composition of species to a forest that's more adapted to high temperatures and low moisture. So again, just as we saw in the changes in forest composition in the east, the more frequent wildfires are causing changes in the composition of species in forest in these wildfire areas. And then, you know, of course, it's always more, more, more. Um, the climate threats interact. So we got interaction between the pests, the drought, the fires. We've already talked about pine beetles that killed or maimed millions of tree trees in the West, okay, producing stands of trees with many of which are dead. Um, big drought caused millions and millions of dead trees over uh, millions of acres. These trees were already weakened by the pine beetle, okay? And so then it dried up and that became even worse. And then the fires came. So it's just piling on and it's really a bad, bad situation. In the West, the fire season is now two and a half months longer than it was in 1970. In fact, a large fraction of the fire service budget is now spent fighting fires because that is the urgent priority number one, less spent on forest maintenance. 2021 is probably going to be turned out to be one of the worst years yet. So very, very rough on people who live in the Western states. Um, now, I've outlined all the, a lot of problems and um, I've given a few solutions, but not, you know, a large, not a huge number of solutions. But we can do some things and it's important to think about what things we can do. The first thing I think we need to do, we in the sort of general uh, definition of people in North America is it's time to think about our point of view. Humans often think of ourselves as outside nature, 
you know, uh, I don't need to worry about that because I don't really care about going hiking or, you know, fishing or I don't do that stuff. So eh, it doesn't doesn't affect me. This is really kind of a fundamental part of Western culture, and it goes way back to Aristotle. OK, um, some of you who've known me from before know that I um, when I used to do biological research, I am, I'm an evolutionary biologist. And so <laughs> I've thought about evolution a lot. And back in Aristotle's time, what, 300 B.C. or something, he viewed the world as a ladder, a progression, starting with inanimate matter. OK, then we have plants. Uh, invertebrates, jellyfishes, spiders, snails, clams, lobsters, squids, fish, whales, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, and of course, at the top, humans. Now, never mind that this, now that we understand that evolution is not a ladder, but a tree of life, never mind that higher plants actually evolved <laughs> after a lot of these things. He didn't know that, right? They didn't know about genetics then. But the whole deal is that humans are at the top of the ladder. And that gives us a view like this, with humans basically at the top of the heap in control. Well, we know that there's no other species that can modify their environment as much as humans. So to that extent, yes, we, <laughs> we do have more control over the environment than other species. But that's not always a good thing because as I said, Humans depend on all of these other species. And this is kind of a weird pyramid because it stops at vertebrates, right? Um, so we don't have insects or plants on here. Uh, um, maybe a slightly more benevolent view is this one where humans are sort of holding the rest of biodiversity. Um, but it's still the idea that humans are sort of outside nature, that we are some at some pinnacle. Uh, and... Um, there are various traditions, of course, um, in which, you know, humans are considered as being the, you know, uh, um, able to use all the other species for their own purposes, et cetera. I'm not going to talk about any of that. But the point of view is that this is essentially, uh, I think, what's in most people's minds is that humans are sort of outside of nature. OK, well. That is not true, <laughs> because as I told you in the beginning, we need, depend on all these ecosystem services. So when I, I let me go back to this one. When I went uh, on the internet, I, I searched for pictures of biodiversity, and these were two of the most common ones I saw. Again, suggesting that there's this view of humans as being outside. Um, of course, we're, they're not outside. And the way that this picture appeared on the internet was as a pair with this. So this is ego, humans are on the top. And this is point of view is more eco, where humans are in the middle of the rest of organisms, okay? And we know from the evolutionary point of view that that is absolutely the case. And, you know, functionally, it would really help us to understand that we depend on all these other species. So just stop beating that dead horse, but the question is, do we have what it takes to shift our attitude enough to actually fix the problems that I have outlined and, you know, all the other ones I haven't talked about? Um, there's a great paper that came out again in uh, this is a report it came out in 2020. And the idea is how to bend the curve on biodiversity loss. If we here's biodiversity. Uh, if we do nothing, biodiversity is, and this is the generous point of view, it only declines linearly. I think really it'll de decline faster. Okay. But anyway, it, it, it is a cartoon just to get us thinking. If we don't do anything, we're going to lose a lot of biodiversity by 2050. And there are various wedges of things we can do that will rescue various amounts of biodiversity. So this is sort of all stylized, but the idea is to just talk about the things that we can do each one of these wedges. So the first one of these wedges that would help preserve biodiversity is consume less stuff, buy less. So this is kind of the motif for American shoppers or maybe amazon.com. And um, a lot of the stuff you buy uh, at malls or whatnot is not very well made. Uh, it's made to wear out you know, instantaneously. You can't fix it. Uh, so it's like, buy it, use it for a little bit, throw it away. Well, that's extractive economy again, you know, and we wind up with gigantic amounts of garbage and no natural resources. So 
if you are financially able, it is much better to buy good quality stuff, clothes and other things, and then fix it. Okay. Fix it instead of throwing it away. I will say my kids laugh at me because I try to fix stuff. (laughs) Sometimes I succeed at fixing it. Sometimes I'm not so successful, but um, I hate throwing stuff away and uh, that I could fix. And I have succeeded in fixing quite a bit of stuff. Anyway, another thing is when you get your credit card out, ask yourself, do I really need this? You know, we try to teach our kids the difference between wanting something and needing it. Okay. And as adults, I can promise you, I'm not always that great at that. Okay. But I try to ask myself, do I really need that? And sometimes I can say, no, I don't. And then I can put my credit card away. (laughs) So that's a, I try to practice this. The other thing is you can capitalize on stuff other people don't want and buy vintage, you know, which used to be called used, um, or consignment store stuff. So for example, consignment store furniture is often really high quality and really inexpensive. Whereas new furniture you buy is often really terrible quality. And also it's filled with like chemical fire retardants and stuff like that. So buy used stuff and sell your old stuff to people who, other people who want it. That's called the circular economy. So consume less. Produce sustainably, that's the next wedge. Um, We really need to revamp agriculture to increase biodiversity. And there are a number of things that can be done there. This is one that I really like. Uh, This is called a prairie strip. Um, It's in between fields of, looks like soybeans, could be corn. Um, Farmers in the upper Midwest are now planting these strips of native plants, which have very deep roots. And um, as chemicals uh, run off of this field going downhill, they run through here and that the deep roots and the good soil in there purify and remove some of those chemicals and reduce the amount of runoff. So it really helps clean the water. Um, It provides a lot of assistance to pollinators. Really, really a great thing. So there are a number of um, uh, tools in conservation and agriculture that are now coming to the fore and are being used. You know, we still have this big, these big monoculture fields, but hey, got to start somewhere. Um, we could increase energy efficiency in manufacturing. I'm not even going to go there, but that's a huge area. Energy efficiency is the best way to get new energy, right? Which is don't use it. And um, the whole idea of energy efficiency is to maintain the same standard of, you know, effectiveness by using less energy. So you can use an LED string of Christmas lights that take four watts for 100 lights versus 100 watts for an incandescent string of Christmas lights. You still have a string of 100 Christmas lights and you're using 96% less energy. So that's energy efficiency is really great. Waste less, recycle more. We're going to talk about food waste, et cetera, later on in this series. But one thing about recycling is after, you know, we used to just ship everything off to China and say goodbye to it. Uh, The Chinese stopped taking all of our stuff. And now, at least in Maryland, we have a lot of trouble finding markets for recycled material. And it's really important to solve this so that we can actually effectively recycle, because right now the recycling system seems sort of broken. And even though we see these stickers and posters around all over the place. I think it's really important to every once in a while, just reconsider these words, reduce. We already talked about reduce what you buy, reuse it, fix it, use it again. Don't worry about buying the latest model of everything and then recycle. This is the last line of defense. Composting food or recycling stuff is the last line. If you don't have it or you used it again, you don't have to recycle it. Okay, next one, reduce the other drivers like land conversion of forest to suburb. Um, you can't stop building new houses and you know building things, but it's really important to encourage your state or your municipality to think hard and invest in smart growth. And I really do not see why developers can't be requested or forced to leave the trees, at least leave the big trees 
instead of scraping off everything when they build a subdevelopment like this, if they had to leave some trees, of course, that's inconvenient for them and they don't want to do it. But, well, there it is, obviously. Reduce chemical pollution, very important. Reduce light pollution. Light pollution, this is, um, I think this is Hong Kong or Singapore, some, some Asian city, but light pollution is everywhere. And insects do very badly when there's too much light at night because they are compelled to fly to it and then they die. Um, and so reducing light pollution is really important. Reducing invasive species is really important. Um, slow climate change. Well, goes without saying, here's a coal fired power plant in Maryland. Um, it, Apparently, the coal-fired power plant companies in Maryland say they're all going to be offline by 2027 or 2025. I can't remember which one. Many of them have gone offline for coal and are coming back as burning gas. That's not that much of an improvement, um, except maybe for the emissions of, uh, I think, something like 85 toxic substances come out of the smokestacks of coal-fired power plants. Not so many out of gas power plants, but that gas is not a big solution for climate change. So mm. I think it's important to really get tough on emissions. Stop letting people, companies just emit stuff, emit carbon dioxide and other toxins into the air. One way to do that would be to put a price on carbon. Of course, there's a big discussion about this because we don't want to institute a price on carbon that's going to hurt people in lower economic brackets more than it hurts people in higher economic brackets, that's not fair, but there are ways of doing that. If people had to pay, and corporations, if this corporation had to pay for the pollution it puts into the air, then people would use less. That's just, that's pretty much been proven. Anyway, that's the topic for another day. Um, finally, conserve and restore our natural lands. We have a lot of natural parks that we can conserve and um, and keep set aside as native. Right now, there's a lot of activity in natural parks, in natural forests. There's logging, there's drilling, there's allowing people to graze their cattle on grassland. Uh, those things are not helping preserve biodiversity. Um, and, but again, they're seriously entrenched in um, uh, the way that we use these public lands. Um, in the next uh, webinar uh, on July 7th, I think it is. Um, I'll talk about increasing land preserves and the 30 by 30 plan that President Biden is, is um, working on. Um, it's important to revamp urban and suburban landscaping, as I mentioned. I like this picture because this is Chicago, and this is a field outside Chicago, which has been planted into a native meadow. Um, this is really great it, it, to use land in this way and build that homegrown national park. Um, I won't talk about it much more, but you can look that up if you're interested. Okay, I want to finish up. How are we going to pull all these things off? Okay, this is really hard. Getting people to change is really hard. Nobody wants to change. Let's put it that way. So the first step, I think, is to work yourself to accept the need for change. I think of it like a multiple choice question. You know, what would you like your future to be? A, B, C, or D? Most people want to choose the answer. I want it to stay the same. Well, that's not even on on there. It's not, not one of A, B, C, or D. It, that is not an option for the future. So we have to come to grips with that. Work to accept the need for change. Get educated so you can teach others and lead by example. Well, you're doing that by being at this webinar and probably you do that in many other ways each day. But as people you know, accept the need for change and they start changing in their own lives, and this changes social norms, this changes what people regard as acceptable and usual. Um, when people, more people value nature, more people uh, plant their own gardens and they plant native plants in their homes and you know, they buy energy efficient cars, et cetera. This changes what people think is usual and acceptable. Those are the social norms. And that kind of pushes society along. Do what you can in your own world. Uh, we don't control many things in life, but we do at least control in most cases what we do in our own homes. <laughs> in our, if we have a yard, we are able to have input into our community. And I look at it like this. There is so much to do and people like to do different things. So pick your passion, whatever it is you find important and interesting to work on and work on that. 
Okay. Not everybody has to do everything. In fact, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. So pick the thing you think is worth doing and do that. Then down here, number four, get mad. Let yourself get worked up about this because this is really important. Make some noise. Go march. This is the People's Climate March in New York in 2015 when the streets were jammed with 500,000 people. Okay. And it makes a difference. It seems like it's a long slog. It's a lot of effort to get the politicians to notice and do something about this. It is really hard. It should not be that hard, but it is hard. But when you show up and you say, I will not accept X, then somebody will listen. So call your politicians and say, I don't want you to vote for that. I want you to vote for this and vote for politicians that share your values. Okay. Very, very important. Here's another hard one. Support good policies, even if you don't want to, even if they cost you something. For example, um, a, a, a lot of neighborhoods do not want solar farms near them because they don't want to have, they don't like the way they look. OK, they they don't want to people don't on the coast don't want to see that windmill 20, you know, the dim, dim light of that windmill at night, 17 or 20 miles off the coast. That has been a big problem in Maryland. Um, and the deal is we need these sources of clean energy. And so we need to be able to accept them. OK, we can't say I not in my backyard. Right. NIMBY. we cannot say that because we need this stuff. And so we got to suck it up in a way and just say, if I have to, you know, do that, then okay. And finally, don't give up. We can't give up. I mean, there are a lot of times I want to give up, let me tell you. But if we don't do this, who's going to do it? Okay. If we don't stand up for the environment to increase, you know, to stop climate change, increase biodiversity, to keep all life forms from dying. Who is going to do it? Okay. I can't figure out who's going to do it if, if you know, people like us are not doing it. So um, I encourage you to sort of move forward with optimism. And um, the, the additional webinars in this series, I hope will provide you with a lot of ideas for things that you can do and ways to stay hopeful, uh, even when that can be a little bit hard. So Thank you very much for attending the webinar. And I hope that you will register for the future webinars. Um, uh, um, I don't have the URL here for that, but um, I've done a lot of advertising. So hopefully you can find that. Um, you can go to my website called climatecorner.org and you can register there.